Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. My name is Cindy Edwards. I'm the Division Chair for Governmental Affairs with the Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and the Board of Directors, it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. I also get the distinct privilege of introducing Jim Roddy to come provide the invocation this morning. He is a former Chairman of the Board of Directors and a very dear friend. We give thanks for the opportunity we have to participate in this 21st annual State of, of the Community Breakfast. We are pleased um, that the officers and staff of the Marine Corps Air Station New River uh, provided this venue for this opportunity. Heavenly Father, we are blessed with a community, with leaders, elected officials, government officials, um, service providers, many, many who, who participate in the daily, the daily business um, of running th in this community. We thank thee for the, the fact that they put community above self in managing the affairs and they work in concert with each other to make this a thriving community. We thank them for, th for their efforts and we pray that they will continue to do so. We are also mindful of the sacrifices that our families make in allowing us the opportunities to do as we, as we do in overseeing the affairs in, in this county and this community. Heavenly Father, we have so much to be thankful for in this country and in, in this community. We thank the, chairman, the, the Chamber of Commerce and all of the partners that work in concert uh, to make this effort survive as successful as possible. We thank thee for the business leaders and the business workers and all of those who put community above self. Heavenly Father, we thank, we turn our attention now to the food that we received this morning. May we be nourished by that food as we are nourished by the presence of the Spirit in our lives. And may we, as we travel throughout this county and this day, do so in safety. And may all that we come in contact with, um, may they all be blessed. And may they have a positive thought and a positive feeling of being in our presence and us in their presence for the while, time that we are. Again, we thank thee for all that we do with, and, and all of the blessings that we receive from thee. And we pray also, Heavenly Father, that we will act in accordance with thy wishes. May all those who are running for office, may they ha continue to have the thoughts of this community above those of, of self. And we offer this prayer to thee, Heavenly Father, at this time, and we do so in the name of our beloved Savior, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, and now, ladies and gentlemen, with your permission, I would like to turn the microphone over to Lorette Legan, President of the Jacksonville Onslow Ch County Chamber of Commerce. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a lot of our elected officials that chose to be with us today, so I would like for them to stand when I call your name and let's thank them for their service to our community. North Carolina Republic, uh, Representative George Cleveland. From the 4th Judicial District, Judge Billy Sutton. <laughs> Onslow County Commission Chairman, Barbara Eichner. <laughs> Vice Chairman, Paul Buchanan. <laughs> Commissioner Millionaire Williams. Commissioner W.C. Jarman. We are also joined by Onslow County Sheriff Hans Miller. Representing the Onslow County School Board, Chair Pam Thomas. Joel Churchwell. 
Brock Ridge, <laughs> Earl Taylor, <laughs> Paul Wiggins, <laughs> and last but not least, Bob Williams. Representing the Jacksonville Town Council, we have Mayor Pro Tem Mike Lazara. Uh, Town Council Member Jerry Bittner. And uh, Council Member Bob Warden. And our representative today from Swansboro is Town Commissioner Pat Turner. As you know, with the Chamber of Commerce, you can't have events such as this without the support of our members. So now, a word from our sponsors. <laughs> She usually writes my speeches for me, but since I'm not the chairman of the board, she said, you're on your own this year. <laughs> so, in the program, it says, word from our sponsor. So I guess I just get one word today. Thanks. <laughs> just kidding. We are, Jones Onslow EMC is very proud to be the sponsor of this 21st annual State of the Community Breakfast. Uh, we're pleased to see so many people here. Thank you all for coming out. You're going to hear some great speakers. And I am so excited this year because I get to sit down there and watch everything. So, without any further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Jeff Clark. like the last couple years I've been following him with everything. <laughs> For the record, I was here first. <laughs> it's my pleasure to, uh, this morning to introduce our speakers, and with your permission, I'm going to do this all at once instead of coming up here between each one for, for the sake of speed. Um, you'll be hearing today from Colonel Tim Salmon, the commanding officer of Marine Corps Air Station New River. Thank you, Tim, for having us here today. Thank you for being the mayor out here. Um, Rick Stout, the superintendent of Onslow County Schools, Colonel Yori Escalante, who is the deputy commander for Marine Corps Installations East and Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune, our reigning uh, person of the year, man of the year, Jeff Hudson from Onslow, uh, Onslow County, being our Onslow County manager. We will hear today from the city from Dr. Uh, Richard Woodruff, uh, from the hospital, the chief executive officer of Onslow Memorial Hospital, the Dr. Ed Piper. And rounding out this morning's festivities will be Dr. Ron Lingle, President of Coastal Carolina Community College. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Colonel Salmon. I always have to move that mic up a little bit. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Marine Corps Air Station New River. It is truly an honor and a privilege to host this event here at our beautiful club and facility. I hope you all got through the gates fine this morning. As you can see, we take security pretty seriously. I understand some people who didn't have the right uh, identification needed to go see the Pass and ID office, but uh, I'm glad to see you here. And uh, you got to see some of the construction going on in the air station right down the road here to the O Club. So a lot going on at New River Air Station. While the Marine Corps has been downsizing over the last few years from 202,000 to about 182,000, New River Air Station has actually increased its population by about 10%. We've added two squadrons over the last two years, Marine Helicopter Squadron Heavy, HMH 366, brought about 360 Marines and their CH-53 C Stallions from Cherry Point as they relocated here to New River. That happened in August and then last November in 14, we had HMLA, or Marine uh, Medium Helicopter Squadron Light Attack, uh, 467, brought about 460 Marines and their AH-1 Cobras and UH-1 Hueys. So all in all, we've increased the air station by roughly 700 Marines. So we have 
7,700 Marines here at New River Air Station now, and overall 17,000 service members, family members, civilians here at New River Air Station supporting the mission. Conversely, over the past year, we've also had one of our squadrons leave New River Air Station and go out to Yuma, Arizona. That was our Operational Test and Evaluation Squadron, VMX-22. They've relocated because they're starting to take on responsibilities for the Joint Strike Fighter, the F-35 Stovall aircraft that the Marine Corps will institute. They'll do operational test and evaluation out there. However, some of that squadron still remains here in support of the CH-53 Echo and the future CH-53 Kilo. It was originally located here because of its kind of namesake, VMX-22, which dealt with MV-22 tilt rotor aircraft as this became the center of excellence for tilt rotor aviation in the Marine Corps. We also support uh, now over 20 squadrons at New River Air Station. That's in, uh, commanded by two marine aircraft groups, and we have the Center for Naval Aviation Technical Training, which trains all of our mechanics for CH-53s and V-22s. A large portion of the Air Station's military construction has completed over the last few years. Some over, older facilities have been renovated as well. Since the last state of the community breakfast, we had a ribbon cutting ceremony for our HMHT CH-53 training squadron. We had a, our combat aircraft loading area was also completed. And Marine Tilt Rotor Squadron Mega Hangar, which houses four V-22 squadrons, we had a ribbon cutting ceremony in April of the past year. We invited many local uh, military and civilian leadership to attend that. That is the largest hangar in the Marine Corps. It's over 430 yards long, wide open. We can house all the aircraft from those four squadrons in that hangar up to a Category 3 hurricane. So it offers a great capability here at New River Air Station. It's allowed us to accept those two other squadrons. We've also accepted some people from the um, Fleet Readiness Center up at Cherry Point so that they can do maintenance on our H-1 aircraft right here at New River instead of having to fly those aircraft or truck them up to Cherry Point for some intermediate level maintenance. So a lot of changes going on here at New River Air Station. Uh, we also have ongoing construction at the Installation Personal Administration Center. We have a communication center going up. We have a maintenance training center for the new 53 kilo. We have a control, corrosion control facility that's being built and the barracks renovation. All in all, the mega hangar, the CH-53 training squadron hangar, was about $226 million, and the most recent uh, construction I was talking about is about $45 million, so a lot of money going into the community, the local workforce. All in all, the New River's economic impact statement for 2015 is roughly $540 million. That's about $60 million more than it was last year. That includes our personnel costs, payroll, facility statement restoration and modernization, military construction, and health care. At the same time, there have been some cost-saving measures where we can. We've consolidated our Marine Corps Community Services, New River, with Camp Lejeune's, and we've also consolidated our public affairs offices. So now we leverage both of those organizations for opportunities such as this breakfast, along with the Red Bull Global Rally Cross event that you may have heard of or hopefully attended last year. We had over 10,000 spectators right on our flight line out here uh, with um, cars that are basically Ford Fiesta type of vehicles where they put 650, uh, 650 horsepower engine inside of them and we raced them up and down our runways and on some dirt track, ran over some jumps. They brought in their 18-wheeler trucks to support those vehicles all right on our flight line next to our aircraft and so the Marines, the civilians could get a chance to very uh, closely see that race and understand what goes into it. So we're happy to have done that. Uh, it was also televised by NBC, so about a million people around the globe saw that event. And we're going to get a chance to do it again, I think, in 2016. So I hope you all can make that event. Um, and in conclusion, I would like to thank you personally for what you do for our Marines, our sailors, even the airmen on this installation. We have about 20 of them. Uh, and it's certainly the families. It's the support that you provide to our military and civilian community that makes this place, Jacksonville and New River, quite different from many others. And in the end, you're supporting our national defense. Thank you very much. Again, Colonel Salmon, thank you for hosting this event. And thanks to everyone for um, 
welcoming me back um, to say a few words about our wonderful school system, Monzo County Schools. I am truly honored um, to serve as your superintendent in this community. It is evident by the caring of our, um, that you give out to our youth and also to our military families that transition in and out. The partnerships, um, we have a lot of partnerships throughout the community. As I look through the audience, I recognize so many people and more like family. Um, but a special thanks to our Board of um, County Commissioners um, for working with us in the school system, for adopting the funding formula that has been so helpful in terms of for us to know how to budget each year and also providing two new school buildings that is much needed in our district. So thank you um, personally from me and from our Board of Education for working with us so cl closely and County Manager Jeff Hudson has also been um, very close in conversations with me and a number of different things that we do in and out of the school system that a lot of people don't see behind the, see behind the scenes. Um, our partnerships with business and nonprofits in our community um, again, it's tremendous. It's over $1 million that comes in from, from these businesses. And I cannot tell you how many thousands of hours um, that we have in terms of volunteer services that we have that come in and out of our schools each and every day. What do we look like? Uh, what's our identity? We have 3,333 employees in our system. We're currently over the 26,000 mark in terms of student population. We have grown over the last 20 years, but we're growing over an average of about three to 350 students each and every year. With that come some challenges as well in terms of overcrowding our schools. Um, obviously last year we, we took on the task of redistrict. That was very difficult, but, but needed, and we've done everything we possibly could. Most of that growth is not coming from the military as it had for a number of years. A lot of people are coming back to Onzo County and residing in our county and um, we're seeing that most of the growth is non-military with all the businesses going up on Western Boulevard obviously we know um, that has impacted our school system quite a bit. We are now the 12th largest school district in the state. We were 13th moving 12th and we're very close to being the 11th largest. We have 28 different languages spoken in our school district. We have a diverse student population. 14% of our students identified as exceptional children in our schools. 12% are academically gifted, 45% economically disadvantaged, and 38% of that 26,000 make up military families. Our last year, four year graduation rate was uh, 89.2, which is above the state average. Our five-year cohort is just over 90 percent, and we, have, we would still love to get that 100 percent um, one day. We are exceeding the state proficiency average in biology in fifth and eighth grade science. Our ACT work keys, the tests given to students who are taking career tech classes, um, we're doing very well. In fact, Onslow County Schools were third in the state for students earned industrial recognized credentials. So. Uh, we're also proud of, of our partnership with Dr. Lingle. Dr. Lingle has been instrumental in, um, with me and partnered with me as well as a mentor. And um, we have 150 students that are taking dual credit, college and career, that have completed uh, college work. And we're looking forward to a possibility of the early college um, coming to uh, Coastal Community. I think it's going to be a great asset for us as we move forward and the possibilities that bring. Thank you, Dr. Lingle, for working with us so closely. We have so much to celebrate. We also have challenges as well. Um, some of the challenges, again, we talked about the overcrowding in some of our schools. Um, state funding has not always been what we want it to be, and we're continuing to work on that. Um, technology, we're very technology rich within our district. We're recognized as one of 70 school systems in, this, in the nation. I talked about this last year, um, and the digital promise is being a leader. You know, we went to the White House and all that, and we're continuing to be a leader in that forefront. But the cost of technology, folks, are, is rising, and, and the cost is hard to keep up with when you have 26,000 kids to serve. But we're doing a phenomenal job, I think, in terms of 
reaching that um, need at the current moment. I academically, <clears throat> um, our third and eighth grade students in reading proficiency is not where we want it to be. We still have 45% that are meeting, that are not meeting grade proficiency that we need to work on, um, as well as 50% of our third and eighth graders in math. And our math one, for those parents in here, is a whole different a level of math than what we learned in our schools and our standards are a little different in terms of what we're doing now the rigor is higher and we are certainly looking at the challenges of what we need to do internally and to provide the resources to the teachers that make it happen each and every day we have quality teachers in our classroom we're very proud of them principals as well and staff members um, all the things that I mentioned to you before is not taken lightly in terms of the challenges. So what are we doing about that? Well, I can't tell you in my own words. I would like to show you a short video that will explain to you a little bit of what we're doing inside our schools. In the Onslow County school system, excellence in education is not just our mission, but evident in so many exciting ways. Our school system educates and supports our students from the very beginning. At our early childhood center and in our six preschool programs in the district, highly trained staff provide an educational experience rich in resources so our youngest students may actively engage in exploring their own curiosity and learning. Literacy and technology are a focal point at this early age, laying a foundation for future learning success. A wide variety of educational and socially developmental activities happen every day in an Onslow County Elementary School. Students participate in small reading groups utilizing research-based best practices, foreign language immersion programs, science and technology activities, global studies, physical education, music, cultural arts, and environmental studies, all geared toward developing a student's critical thinking, reading, writing, and math skills. Appreciating and accommodating a student's learning interests and style is key to the school choice opportunity. Themed elementary schools offer students ways to learn that are customized to their personal talents while building confidence and new skills. Students who attend Silverdale Elementary are part of the Leader in Me Learning Through Leadership program. This program is based on Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and equips students with the skills and self-confidence they need to thrive in the 21st century economy. Other opportunities include design thinking, global stewardship, communities in action, and science, technology, engineering, and math focused themes. At the elementary level, we have two magnet schools with one year-round choice for students and parents. Middle school is a transitional time for students and emphasis is placed on developing study skills and college or career path interests. Assisting in this effort is the AVID program. AVID, Advancement via Individual Determination, promotes positive peer group interactions for students, provides intensive support with tutorials, strong student-teacher advocacy, and develops a sense of hope for personal achievement gained through hard work and determination. We are proud to have earned three National AVID demonstration sites and periodically host educators from across the nation to visit and see how AVID is making a difference in our students' educational and future success. In our high schools, smaller learning communities and a wide variety of specialized educational opportunities are available. At Jacksonville High, the International Baccalaureate program teaches students to be critical and creative thinkers through examining worldwide topics and making real-world connections. At White Oak, Richlands, and Swansboro, Project Lead the Way prepares students for the pursuit of a post-secondary education and careers in math, science, engineering, and technology. Dual enrollment at Coastal Carolina Community College allows students to take college courses and earn credit toward their degree while still in high school. 
Three of our high schools offer career academies, awarding certificates, making students work ready upon graduation. Through the innovative Onslow View closed circuit broadcast system, French 1 and 2 classes are offered to our students by our own faculty. Year-long visiting instructors from China at Dixon High teach students the Chinese language and culture and is yet another way we are better preparing our students to be globally competitive. High school level extracurricular activities enjoy a long tradition of excellence. Our athletic programs boast many state championships and contenders for state titles, as do our marching bands. Musical theater has been a standard for over 50 years, and all of our high schools and many middle and elementary schools feature musical productions. At all grade levels, students have access to technology tools to enhance learning and digital literacy. Technology-rich classrooms are equipped with smart boards, laptops, and other multimedia devices. And through the Learning Advantage, the one-to-one -one laptop initiative, Dell laptops are deployed to students in grades 5, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and provide opportunities for personalized learning. Academic enrichment opportunities are also available on every grade level through Geography Bees, Science Olympiads, Spelling Bees, Academic Derby, Young Authors Showcase, Woodman of the World Speech Contests, and Science Fairs. In the Onslow County School System, our students are taught and supported by effective professional educators and auxiliary staff, all of whom are deeply committed to every child's success in a college or career path. Many of our Teachers of the Year have been regional or state finalists for the state title, and for the second year in a row, our Assistant Principal of the Year for the District has been elected as the Assistant Principal of the Year for the State of North Carolina. Our commitment to our students means a commitment to continuous improvement. Across the district, teachers have been instrumental in developing their own benchmarks for student success based on state standards of achievement. Covey Leadership Training and the Five Choices Workshop have been offered and effectively utilized for educators and staff wanting to hone their professional and personal productivity and improvement. Another aspect to our district continuous improvement efforts is our participation in the rigorous Advanced Ed Accreditation Program. Accreditation ensures a consistent level of quality through an on-site external review of all systems affecting educational outcomes and under that umbrella makes the quest for excellence a cultural habit. Accreditation is about a district being the best it can be on behalf of the students it serves. The Onslow County School System is proud to have been the first school district in the state of North Carolina to be accredited by Advanced Ed and the first to be re-accredited in 2014. On the horizon for the Onslow County School System, we have the construction of two new schools already in the works and three additional schools planned to accommodate the educational needs of our expanding student population. But this is only a small picture of what happens in our schools every day. And we invite you in to see for yourself how our students are achieving excellence in their educational pursuits. So as you can see, I could not say that <clears throat> or captivate. What are our students? Aren't they fabulous? Our teachers as well. As I close today, I want to recognize my board. Thank you for allowing me to be the superintendent here in this district. It's, it's the number one for me in this state, and I brag about it everywhere I go throughout the state and the nation. I'd also like to thank my staff, if you'll stand. They, this is part of the team. This is not because of me. It's all because of what they do behind the scenes. Please stand. It takes a village to raise a child. We're, we're living that each and every day. It's what the community does for us that makes the biggest impact. Thank you again for your volunteering, for being parents, and for being leaders in our district. Thanks again for having me.
Howdy. Howdy. Good morning. Okay, so I didn't intend to be here again representing the CG, <laughs> but here I am. I think next year I'll come in as maybe the warm-up act. So, uh, as I've said before, on behalf of Brigadier General Widely, who is currently at a month-long PME, thank you for the opportunity to be with you here today. Uh, the CG deeply regrets not being here, and I'm sure he has told each and every one of you how much he enjoys the interaction that he has with this great community. Uh, I've been told that I can't bring up the Super Bowl. <laughs> However, you know, being an Aggie, you have to try to find some good in everything, and I just have to let you know that the head coach and the MVP of the Super Bowl were graduates of Texas A&M. So. <laughs> Up front, I want to thank Onslow County and the city of Jacksonville for the fantastic job they did in hosting the 2nd Marine Division 75th anniversary parade this Saturday. To witness the number of spectators and the 5,000 Marines and sailors who marched down downtown Jacksonville was truly awesome. And the veterans of the 2nd Marine Division who led the parade were deeply moved by the event. It's a clear testament to the mutually supportive relationship that we have here with our community and with the military. So on behalf of, Brig of Major General Miller, the CG of 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force, Major General Boudreau, the CG of 2nd Marine Division, and Brigadier General Widely, I thank the leadership and the citizens of Onslow County and Jacksonville for the support over these many years. I think we're also equally proud of the fact that Camp Lejeune was awarded the 2015 Commander's, Commander in Chief's uh, Excellence in Installations Award, the first since 2009, but the sixth overall, and we're going to try and keep that going on. Uh, and keep that trophy uh, within the uh, entryway there at Building 1 at Camp Lejeune. What I'd like to do this morning is bring you up to speed on some things that are going on within the Marine Corps and how they affect our installations here in eastern North Carolina. Colonel Salmon's already mentioned a few things that are, that are going on here at New River, and I'll probably echo a few of those as well because so much of what goes on at Camp Lejeune affects New River, and so much of what goes on at New River affects Camp Lejeune. We're all big, one big happy community, and we wouldn't want it any other way. 37th Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Robert Neller, took the helm just this past fall uh, after the 36th Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Joseph Dumford, was called upon by the President to become the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff only, being a, only after being the Commandant for a year. Uh, General Neller has fully embraced the course that General Dunford laid out when he became the Commandant back last year, and just recently General Neller published uh, an addendum to General Dunford's planning guidance, that being FRAG Order 01 TAC 2016 entitled Advance to Contact. It offers additional goals based on his initial visits with thousands of Marines across the Marine Corps that he conducted this fall. And it explains that we're not in an interwar period. The Corps remains forward deployed and engaged in harm's way, and it's going to continue that way. He acknowledges, though, that this is a situation that's complicated by a constrained resource environment from which we must continue our current operations, reset our equipment, and maintain our warfighting readiness, all at the same time modernizing our force. General Neller's perspective on the Corps' future challenges and goals directly influences how we at the installations will continue to support the Marine Corps' mission as a whole. He acknowledges there's no indications that the demand for Marines is going to cease anytime soon, and I think if you see the news and read the newspapers, you will probably agree that that's the case. The FRAG order, though, also states that we will maintain and man our bases and stations to enable deployment for contingencies, provide realistic training, and provide the support to Marines and their families that is essential to their preparedness and our high operational tempo. Now, how you do that in a reduced operational support cost environment is something that we at the installations have been tackling for several years now. We continue to reevaluate and prioritize our resources to optimize those critical services that we offer. Reducing energy consumption and conserving our fiscal resources is key. Ensuring installation security and safety, improving aging infrastructure, and supporting training on, a new, on all of our new weapon systems remains our task. 
Major General Miller will tell you that the 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force is as busy as it's ever been and he wouldn't want it any other way. One of the Corps' strengths is its ability to build Marine Air Ground Task Forces in order to go forward and do the nation's bidding. As our nation's commitments in Iraq and Afghanistan reduced, TUMEF began focusing on the complex operating environments that are in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, shifting its operational footing to maintaining a constant state of readiness to respond to emerging crises across the globe. Right now, special purpose Marine Air Ground Task Forces in Africa, Europe, Central and South America are in place and maintain that presence to deter conflicts before they occur or respond as the situation rises. Along with that, Marine Expeditionary Units continue to float, providing 26 mission sets that are on call when needed. Major General Miller says that 2MEF is on a very solid course and, con and constitutes a force that is ready to respond to any mission that it's called upon to do. If you've traveled around Jacksonville uh, and as far north as I-40 and I-95, you probably see the Protect What You've Earned billboards. Uh, this is a huge 2MEF responsibility campaign that is now taking hold across the Marine Corps. It's to motivate Marines to avoid making potentially career-ending choices that typically are fueled by alcohol. Marines have the highest rate of excess alcohol use uh, of any of our services. However, researchers will also tell you that six out of every seven Marines and sailors drink responsibly. It's that seventh Marine that probably needs the help. Protect What You've Earned represents a seismic shift in other campaigns and that it focuses on two fundamental foundational principles. One is that it speaks to responsibility and accountability and the second that we treat Marines as adults. The visible reminders outside the gate reinforce the need for the vigilance of our community here in eastern North Carolina to ensure our Marines continue to stay successful and on a career trajectory that they will all be proud of. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, what's been going on on our installations as far as growth and development in the face of downsizing and fiscal challenges. As I talked about earlier, budget constraints are part of our daily business in, uh, in the Marine Corps. We have reached the saturation point, however, where we can do more with less. We challenge ourselves to be better stewards of the taxpayers' dollars, and we've always been that way, and we need to further end as we further lean our operations at every opportunity. Over the past five years, the Corps' budget has reduced by $1 billion annually, resulting in installations conducting feasibility studies and reviews to determine what functions can be consolidated. A lot of times these efforts aren't popular, but they're necessary in order to ensure that we direct our resources to critical requirements. In 2014, consolidation efforts resulted in multi-million dollar savings across the Marine Corps with no loss of support to Marines and their families. So one of the principal economic drivers here in the area, I know everyone is very interested in the population at Camp Lejeune. 182,000 Marines continue to be, continues to be the Marine Corps' goal and the number to best address operational requirements of a steady state deployments, crisis response activities, the potential for major combat operations, all the while still preserving institutional health and readiness. The cuts to Camp Lejeune have been projected at roughly 7,000 by 2020, mainly from support elements within the second MEF, which means that the base population will have dropped from a high in 2012 of 46,000 to about 39,000 in 2020, with nearly 60% of that, or 4,000, taking place over this past year. However, General Neller has already called for another comprehensive review of our force structure based on available resources and current commitments and global threats to ensure that we have what we need and are able to meet the future force requirements that we're called upon, as well as to meet our and pay our taxpayer and our manpower bills. Now, despite the budget cuts and the force reductions, Camp Lejeune still continues uh, construction at the rate of our Grow the Force pace. A lot of that is because of the fact that the Grow the Force money just didn't keep up with the fact that we were increasing and now we're decreasing. More than 381 construction projects are currently taking place on Camp Lejeune and right here at Marine Corps Air Station New River, as Colonel Salmon has mentioned, with a value total of more than $1.8 billion dollars. 
Over $250 million of that will be completed uh, before the end of this year, and approximately $610 million in new upgraded or renovated facilities will be conveyed to Camp Lejeune and New River this year. Of note, major construction and renovation projects will improve barracks, workspace, training facilities, and other facilities at Wallace Creek, Courthouse Bay, Stone Bay, and at our Naval Hospital. Of course, the base entry road project, that being the construction of the Wilson Gate, the widening of Brewster Boulevard, connecting Wilson Boulevard from Brewster all the way to Holcomb Boulevard and Sneeds Ferry Road, continues to be probably the most visible construction project on Camp Lejeune. We expect soon to complete the construction at the Wilson Gate, and then we can, continue, then we can start having that gate open at a 24-7 pace, and ultimately finish the project this fall, this fall adding another high-speed avenue of approach to get to Mainside Camp Lejeune. I should mention, though, historically that uh, access aboard Marine Corps Station New River and Camp Lejeune has been challenging, but that's about to change. You may have heard recently that Camp Lejeune and New River is phasing in a new access control system. Rapid Gate, already in use at many other Marine Corps installations, is designed to maintain safety and security while providing greater throughput efficiency to access control points. Handheld scanners, and I'm sure you've seen the sentries and the MPs use those handheld scanners as you've come on base. Quickly read, verify, uh, and take a look at a wide assortment of credentials and government and state issued ID cards to include uh, Department of Defense common access cards, retired and military identification cards, uh, driver's licenses, U.S. and Canadian driver's licenses, and other identification. Installation security personnel can now quickly and easily and accurately verify the credential format and the expiration date, as well as ensure that individuals who are debarred from an installation do not gain access. Enrollment provides streamlined vetting onto the installation for the duration of a contract, contract up to one year. Those choosing not to participate in the program will be issued a one-time 30-day pass, followed by a renewal process for every four days. There's going to be delays as we initiate and bring this online, but RapidGate will streamline the vetting process, decrease wait times, and foster better relationships with the businesses and our local communities. RapidGate should be fully implemented on the 23rd of this month with contractor identification expiring on the 22nd. So the time to enroll is now. Please go enroll and make this easier for you to gain access on the installation. Visit www.rapidgate.com forward slash enroll <laughs> to take advantage of this time-saving credential. Our public-private uh, partners have been providing quality military housing and continue to do that both at Camp Lejeune and New River. There are currently quarters for 5,123 military service members and their families with occupancy of just over 90%, which is a little less than last year. Atlantic Marine Corps Communities has completed 52 of the 136 houses in the Knox Landing neighborhood with the remaining homes to be completed this year, and they've also demolished three homes on Hospital Point. Uh, those efforts bring us to an end state of 5,204 homes. Construction in 2016 will include the completion of the Midway Park and Knox Landing Community Centers. Now with that lower occupancy, we've now opened housing units to unaccompanied service members, reservists, Department of Defense civilian employees, military retirees, surviving spouses, and defense contractors with common access cards. Commonly known as the waterfall, there are 153 of these families on Camp Lejeune and New River. However, we're expecting normal family housing levels to begin again as we start doing the summer moves. I mentioned our commitment earlier to reducing energy consumption, and here's how we're doing it at Camp Lejeune. In 2015, the last of two components began of a $150 million effort to reduce energy intensity by 17% by replacing six old, inefficient steam central, central steam heating plants with decentralized natural gas burners at individual buildings. This will save more than 600,000 mega BTUs, I'm told that's a lot, <laughs> per year. And by the end of 2017, the last of our coal-fired uh, steam burners uh, will be taken offline. 
Camp Lejeune also implemented the Marine Corps Energy Ethos Program by training 72 unit energy managers at the battalion sized units to monitor energy efficiency and increase operational effectiveness. This is a, in a, a campaign and an effort to really take ownership of energy use and energy efficiency at the unit level. And while not a direct benefit to the base, the Department of the Navy signed a 30-year lease with Duke Energy Progress and constructed a 13-megawatt solar array aboard Camp Lejeune. This was the first of its kind type of agreement and construction uh, that the Department of the Navy has ever been involved with. And it allows Duke to meet state and federal renewable energy requirements and generate renewable energy to the grid from the base. For its part, Marine Corps Community Services had a successful and challenging past year. Uh, as Fish mentioned earlier, the uh, consolidation is complete now and Marine Corps Community Services Lejeune New River has been established and it's been a success, bringing efficiencies and improvements to the delivery of programs and services on both sides of the river. The consolidation saved precious resources and preserved programs which could have been degraded or even potentially eliminated due to budget cuts both by Congress and by Headquarters Marine Corps. In the midst of all these funding reductions, though, MCCS was successful in bringing some businesses onto the base. Starbucks, Napa Auto Parts, and Taco Bell now operate on Camp Lejeune, and I frequently make a run to the border. <laughs> and a Harley-Davidson accessories store is going to open this, week, uh, this month as well. Equally good news for our civilian partners is that many MCCS events will continue open to the public, enhanced by the consolidation, and relatively unaffected by the funding reductions. This year's Grand Prix series started this past weekend here at, uh, at Marine Corps Air Station New River with the Extreme Endurance 12K, which unfortunately because of the weather and the washout became a 10K, uh, but still a rousing event and of great success and it's going to continue the Grand Prix throughout the, series, throughout the series throughout the year with seven races. Fourth of July celebration will take place on Monday, the 4th of July at the WPT Hill Field, and as Colonel Salmon also mentioned, we anticipate bringing the Marine Corps, the Red Bull Global Rally Cross, maybe we should call it the Marine Corps Global Rally Cross, the Red Bull Global Rally Cross, which was a huge success last year for the Marine sailors and the local community back here at Camp Lejeune. And I still remember walking out my front door on Seth Williams and hearing the buzz of the cars running around New River. It was a tremendous event. Now I constantly brag of that the relationship and partnership that we have between the bases and the surrounding communities is not only the best in the state, but also the best in the nation. Much of that is via the work of the Community Military Cooperative Planning Group. Local elected officials and base commanders together work to identify solutions over issues that affect both the community and the military. Several of these I'll go over with you. Uh, the dredging of the New River Inlet has been reestablished after years of underfunding, allowing TUMEF to conduct amphibious loading through the inlet and also allow commercial and recreational fishermen to pass without the fear of running aground. Freshwater aquifer protection, cooperative community and military law enforcement radio communication for better emergency response, and better traffic flow and control both on and off base demonstrate the desire to forge partnerships through continuous cooperation. And also to the delight of our residents, the Onslow Camp Lejeune Farmers Market aboard Camp Lejeune is continuing. It's growing in popularity and it's growing in size as well. This venture is another way that we, uh, the military, are demonstrating our relationship with working lands under the Sentinel Landscapes Program, whose goal is to preserve land for training as well as protecting them for conservation and agriculture. And finally, here at Camp, we at Camp Lejeune and at New River want to exploit every communication tool possible and available to ensure base residents and the local community stay informed about what's going on within our fence line. While we're still retaining our traditional newspapers and websites, our, special, our social media platform is exploding. We communicate with over 175,000 every week through our Facebook page alone. We communicate, uh, we often feature live webcasts of special events through those venues. We're constantly updating the public with a steady stream of up-to-the-minute information, advisories, and announcements. 
If you have constructive feedback, please use those venues to do so. And don't forget to like us. <laughs> so in closing, I hope this provides a clearer sense of what's going on across our vast installation. There are many external dynamics at work, both globally and in Washington, that can potentially cloud the overall picture and reduce our ability to project what the future holds for more than just a couple of years. But our mission continues, though, to take care of Marines and their families. They deserve nothing less from Camp Lejeune and the local community. Thank you again, and always know that we at Camp Lejeune remain Semper Fidelis. Colonel Salmon always has to move the microphone up. I always have to move it down. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to provide you with a report on the state of our community, Onslow County. I appreciate Chairman Eichner, Vice Chairman Buchanan, and Commissioners Bright, Jarman, and Williams for giving me the opportunity to stand before you. No accomplishment of county government takes place without the vote of the Board of County Commissioners. Our county staff appreciates the due diligence undertaken by the commissioners to address the issues of our day. I take this speech very seriously, and I try to gather information that would be useful to all of you gathered here. I, I must admit, however, that while researching the materials for today, I experienced a moment of profound introspection. I ask myself, when did I become more interested in population statistics than football statistics? I mean, I used to become excited over seeing my dream car, a new red Mustang. Yeah. Now, now I have become excited over seeing a methane gas to electric generator at our landfill. Now, I understand that the first stage of recovery is early acknowledgement of a problem. Today, I tell you that I am aware of my addiction to facts, data, and statistics. But people, I do not have a problem. I can stop any time I want. <laughs> now, for some individuals, a few minutes going over charts and graphs sounds like this. Bueller. Bueller. But to my possibly warped mind, in today's world of pundits, prognosticators, spin, speculation, and outright lies, having verifiable data and facts laid out in black and white is truly refreshing and is profoundly important. So today, I came prepared to share with you certain facts about Onslow County. As recently as January 25th, the Jacksonville Daily News reported that North Carolina is now the ninth most populous state with 10 million residents. Not only has North Carolina grown, but Onslow has as well. Despite the Great Recession and sequestration, Onslow's population grew by 15.97% over the past 10 years. We remain the 11th largest county in the state. And we also remain one of the youngest in the state. Over 29% of the people who live here are 19 years of age or younger. Another 25% are below the age of 29. We have an abundance of young children, and if you don't believe it, once again, you can ask Superintendent Rick Stout. <laughs> Every year, 300 to 400 new students are showing up at the doors of our public school system. And of course, all of these new young families needed a place to live. For years, the hallmark of our growth has been new home construction all over Onslow County. The rapid pace of residential construction has been a great concern. New data shows us that in 2015, there was a 12% decrease in the issuance of new residential permits out in the county. At the same time, there was an 18% increase in residential trade permits, the permits necessary to work on existing homes. 
This is welcome evidence that the free market economy is in the process of self-correcting after the housing bubble. Most out-of-town developers have left town, and our citizens are investing in existing housing. I appreciate Mr. Ken Brandon of Caldwell Banker for this multiple listing service information. Now, this indicates that the resurgence continues in, in resales over new construction since September 2013. As you might well imagine, the type of development that is taking place here is a primary factor in determining the revenue available to meet the needs of, once again in our case, an extremely young growing population. Tax revenue generated from residential property values vastly exceeds revenue generated by commercial property within the county. 69% of all property tax revenues come from residential construction. Ladies and gentlemen, a continued increase in planned, responsible commercial growth is a critical need for our community. Allow me to illustrate uh, my point. The average homeowner in Onslow County who owns a single family dwelling and two cars pays $1,305 per year in county taxes. By comparison, the Krispy Kreme donut shop on Western Boulevard Extension pays $7,799. You all knew I would work Krispy Kreme in there somewhere, didn't you? <laughs> a family dollar, $4,446, and the new Super Walmart in Richlands pays $96,577 per year to Onslow County. One Walmart generates the revenue of 74 houses. But let's not stop there. Let's assume that that average homeowner has two children that attend the Onslow County Public Schools. Onslow County will owe the Board of Education $3,570 annually to merely provide the state average per pupil appropriation to cover those two seats in a public school. Neither a Krispy Kreme donut shop nor a Walmart directly adds student population to our school system. Now, please hear me. I am not saying that our public school education funding formula is incorrect or unfair. Remember, we're just meeting the statewide average per pupil. My point is that residential development alone is not enough to support the services we must provide to our population. We need additional responsible commercial development. Government does not create jobs. The private sector creates jobs. Now, some people say that we may not have done a very good job of it. But friends, the data disputes that opinion. The Department of Commerce reports 1,881 jobs were created in Onslow between 2012 and 2014. So why haven't we been crying this from the rooftops? If Ford Motor Company opened up a plant with 1,800 jobs, it would have made statewide news. It's because our jobs are coming in smaller batches, primarily through the retail, service, and hospitality industries. But I say to you today, jobs are jobs. Now, if, if government doesn't create jobs, how can government help? It is the job of government to provide high quality, essential services using sound financial, tax, and budgetary practices. Essential services for Onslow County fall primarily in, in just three areas, public safety, public education, and human services. Out of a county budget of $195 million, $153 million goes to fund those big three. Commissioners have invested heavily in education, not only due to the tremendous influx of students and aging facilities, but also because a strong school system and community college are vital to quality of life and economic development. Companies do not want to move their executives and their workforce into an area with a failing school system. Thankfully, we have model schools 
and model educators. Educators like Meadowview Elementary Principal Vicki Brown, the 2015 Wells Fargo Principal of the Year. Principal Brown, would you stand up? Do you remember that 29% of the population under the age of 19? Educators like Vicki Brown likely represent the most important government service they receive. Vicki, we all thank you. We thank you for the care you're giving our youth. Now, human services, those functions are largely mandates to county government from either the state or the federal government. Our departments, including social services, the health department, veteran and senior services, help our citizens that are, are in the greatest need. Last December, senior services provided our elderly with 2,815 meals. Our home health and hospice staff made 2,220 visits. When it comes to human services, there are many statistics and many numbers, but numbers don't really tell the entire story. Allow me to introduce one of our home health and hospice nurses, Mr. Colin Monahan. Colin, would you stand? With permission from the family, I want to read you an email I received from some people that Colin helped just last month. My dad passed away Monday. He had been on hospice care for a couple of weeks. I just wanted to pass on my thanks to your staff, Sarah, Little Bit, Jackie, and especially Colin. Your staff did everything they could to make my dad comfortable during his last days, and they did it in a way so that he maintained his dignity. I want to say a special thanks to Colin for coming out on the coldest night of the year at midnight to get him ready for the folks from the funeral home. He went way beyond what he had to do to ensure my dad kept his dignity even after his death. I just wanted to let you know how much this means to my family. Thank you. We all thank you, Colin, for providing the most important service a grieving family can ever receive. Thank you. In addition to support at the end of life, we are there during the trials of life as well through provision of public safety services, including the Sheriff's Office, the Detention Center, and of course, emergency services. The county's commitment to public safety has increased dramatically in recent years. Between 2009 and 2015, we funded 163 new public safety positions, 99 of which were in the Sheriff's Office and Detention Center. There's, there's much data to be mined in public safety. Numbers of calls, response times, training hours, prisoner counts, crime rates. But rather than provide a pie chart, I'd like to introduce a person. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present Ms. Janet Freshour. Ms. Freshour. As, as an emergency telecommunicator, during the last 12 months, Janet has answered nearly 11,000 emergency 911 calls. On the morning of July 4th, 2015, Janet received a 911 call from a man trying to save his wheelchair-bound father. Janet gave CPR instructions to the caller and dispatch paramedics. When the paramedics arrived, they were able to transport a revived patient to the hospital. Janet and the caller saved that man's life. And people, Janet's not alone. She is one of hundreds of public safety professionals that stand between you and disaster. Janet, when your phone rings, you represent the most important government official in the world to your caller. Thank you for your life-saving service. In 
In an environment with a young, growing population, how has Onslow increased funding to the school system, maintained human services, and expanded public safety by 163 new positions? Tough choices had to be made. Few people remember that the county has performed reductions in force in six out of the last seven budget cycles. Between 2009 and 2015, we prioritized resources to afford those 163 positions in public safety, cutting 67 jobs from other county departments. Tax rate increases have been instituted just two times in the past 10 years. In 2009, commissioners faced perhaps one of the largest challenges in the history of the county. Past county leaders had borrowed money for a $58 million jail and a $90 million school construction package with no specific revenue stream earmarked to cover the debt. This was complicated by the fact that the county was still in the Great Recession. The newly elected commissioners were forced to raise the property tax rate. Sixty percent of the property tax increase from that year was used to pay the mortgage for projects begun, for, begun by prior county leaders. The remainder funded public education and, it, and made up for a loss in state shared revenues. Now lately, people have quoted the tax increase without the circumstances behind it. Also admitted is in that year, the Board of Commissioners instituted the deepest cuts of county employees in the history of this government. Dozens of positions were eliminated in that one year alone. The next property tax increase occurred after the 2014 property revaluation. Property values fell dramatically. And as a result, 45% of the tax increase that year was used to generate the same amount of revenue as the year before. The remainder of the increase generated $6.2 million. That amount, coupled with additional sales tax revenue and cuts to existing programs, filled a $10.2 million budget gap, which included money for the public education funding formula, public safety positions, new school construction, and insurance cost increases. Now after talking about those two tax increases, you might ask how our property tax rate compares to other counties in North Carolina. Well, look at the map. The 33 pins on this map represent counties in eastern North Carolina with a higher tax rate than what we have right now. Statewide, a total of 49 of the 100 counties have a higher tax rate than Onslow. Now, I speak of the tax rate, not the tax value. As the real estate saying goes, location, location, location. Naturally, property values vary based on geographical area. More metropolitan counties like Wake and New Hanover have much higher property values than Onslow County, and subsequently they have lower tax rates. But regardless of the location, tax values by law must be set at the market value. Onslow has over 84,000 tax parcels. To ensure that our appraisals are accurate, not only do our certified tax appraisers, appraisers validate the data, but also the state of North Carolina checks the values of all counties on an annual basis. Finally, citizens have the opportunity to appeal any values for which they have data to support a lower property value. Our efforts to be the best simply must not stop. Many of you are familiar with the work of James Collins who writes, good is the enemy of great. And that is one of the key reasons why we have so many that don't become great. We don't have great schools principally because we have good schools. We don't have great government principally because we have good government. Few people attain great lives in large part because it is just so easy to settle for a good life. So how can we move farther toward great? In economic development one of the most important things we can do as a community is to lobby as one united force for better lines of transportation we must have an interstate connector and a railway. Beyond that, we must have sites available for commercial and industrial expansion. 
Now, water and sewer service is already available in many locations. In addition to the city of Jacksonville's large system, Onwasa has opened up thousands of acres of rural land for development by laying 37 miles of water mains and 25 miles of sewer mains in the last two years. Our economic development team, led by Sheila Pierce Knight and Dan Oliver, are working hard to not only serve our existing businesses, but also beat the bushes for possible industrial leads. They report that over the past seven months, they have tracked down 36 leads and currently have 16 industrial prospects. And what can Onslow County do to ensure that we remain prudent in the use of tax dollars? We continue zero-based budgeting, and we continue to challenge the way we provide services in different departments and agencies. As we do so, we have to remember the words of General Colin Powell, who said, experts often possess more data than judgment. So as we review our budget data on human services or education, we must remember that every tax dollar is serving a citizen in need. Today, today, New Hampshire will be the second state in the Union to cast its vote for a person to serve as President of these United States. The leader of a federal government that has been characterized at times by indecision and inaction. In contrast, I am proud to work for a unit of government that has confronted the challenges of our community. And I'm honored to work with people who are acting daily to make decisions in the best interest of the citizens of Onslow County. So back in high school, my mind was consumed with thoughts of that, that red Mustang you saw earlier, and my girlfriend, and quite frankly, whether or not I could get my hair as perfect as Don Johnson. I'm, I'm the one on the right. But today, today, my mind isn't consumed with those things. My mind is consumed with the knowledge that the issues we face as a community are larger than anything one person can handle. Only by coming together as one people can we face the challenges before us. You have chosen to hear this program today because you care about our citizens. You care about our community, our collective good. In this time of challenge and opportunity, I call upon you thoughtful people, you people who are committed to the common good. Take time to discern fact from fiction and truth from lies. Lend your strength and your intellect to making our community great. And above all else, pray that God will continue to bless Onslow County. Thank you. Jeff, my first car was an Austin Healey 3000. It was British blue, had 57,000 miles on it, and was a clunker. And yes, my hair never looked like Don Johnson's. <laughs> we come today to talk about the state of the city of Jacksonville. I'd like to begin by giving you two examples. Yesterday afternoon at about 5 o'clock, our 911 center received a call of a lady who was having a heart attack. In a little over two minutes, city police arrived and began to provide life-saving services. And about a minute later, our fire department arose and they gave assistance. And a little time later, the county EMS arose and they provided additional assistance. And that lady was transported to the hospital and today is alive. That lady is the mother of Mayor Sammy Phillips. That service was not given because the call came in and said, Mayor Sammy Phillips' mother is having a heart attack. That service was given because that's what the employees of the city of Jacksonville 
do every day. They provide you with excellent service. The second example I would like to give occurred this past Saturday. Colonel Escalante has already mentioned the phenomenal parade that we had. Glenn Hargett is in the back. Glenn, take off those earphones and come out here, please. This is the gentleman that was the producer of the parade this past Saturday. Please join me and give me a round of applause. Also in this audience are dozens of people who supported. If you were with the military, in the planning, in the county, with the planning, with the city, with the planning, I'd like for you to stand up and be recognized. Please stand. Colonel, Colonel, <laughs> Jeff, David. We are the home of the Marines and Sailors. We know who we are. We know why we exist. If you want to know the state of this city, look back just three days. That represents the city of Jacksonville. That represents our commitment to who we are and why we exist. Thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to have you join me in viewing the annual video that shows the 2016 update of the city of Jacksonville. Jacksonville's history is a relatively short one compared to many communities. It had a population of about 800 in 1940, when on December 10th, the decision was announced to build a Marine Corps base here. And now, we've been the host community for thousands of Marines and sailors, and we're proud of that. That's why, when the commanding general for the 2nd Marine Division asked the mayor to host a parade and community celebration for the 75th anniversary of the division, we went to work. And the parade and community celebration has been a great success. The military is not just an economic engine for our community, but it is who we are. While some serving the country are only in our community for a very short period of time, others become our definition of natives. No matter the length of their stay, all are integrated in the fabric of this, that makes this a great place. And it contributes to our dedication to not forget what each of these memorials represent and the daily sacrifices of training, deployments, and the impact of the military on family life. So it is that the city of Jacksonville seeks to honor our military, embrace their families, and work to protect the ground on which they practice their mission. Jacksonville is a leader in the Military Host Cities Group, which works to speak out to make sure where our military work and live is a better place. Jacksonville has been a leader in the planning to ensure there is adequate connectivity from our base and other bases to ports, departure locations, and training sites. Collaboration with the military is a key function of major road planning. For local streets that we maintain, the council has adopted a plan that works to improve our C quality streets so they don't become Ds. And along those streets, the city council has encouraged the Clean and Green program, which landscapes, beautifies, and improves our visual appearance. That has also worked for some areas affected by older, vacant buildings. More than 50 buildings have been demolished or removed in the past few years, making our community a better place. That image helps keep our quality of life by providing a better view of our community. We hope it encourages more to come be a part of the city of Jacksonville. As to how many people are here, Jacksonville has taken leadership in an effort to make the census aware that Marines and sailors on assignment from here should be counted here. We think that as many as 20,000 people were not counted in Onslow County during the 2010 census because of a census rule. We argue service members on assignment are just like businessmen who travel on the day of census and are counted at their home. How the military are counted and how we honor their service is an important part of our being. Our Tourism Development Authority adopted Receive a Hero's Welcome to embrace the way this community honors its service members. 
Those honors are evident in the memorials that have been constructed and those under construction, as well as the contributions to the Museum of the Marine to enshrine our legacy as the home to our military. We want to extend that feeling to others who visit our community. Tourism development is part of an economic development strategy, bringing visitors who will contribute to our economy. To advance tourism development even more, a new sports destination facility study is under review now, which could make more travel to our community a year-around option. All this builds on Jacksonville's efforts to improve the quality of life here, to make living in Jacksonville as part of a duty station become a home rather than a place, and to be encouraged to join in this wonderful community fabric of military and civilians. We want to show that every day when any of our citizens receive services from the city. Great customer service has been made a key goal of the management of the city, and we reward great customer service with appreciation and recognition and we work to encourage veteran hiring within the city organization. We leverage our work with the collaboration with others, including Onslow County, Onwasa, the Onslow School Board, and more. And recently, our talks with Onslow Memorial Hospital leadership centered on how the issue of inadequate mental health treatment is affecting all of our community. For the city, the equivalent time provided by eight full-time police officers is expended yearly on mental health issues. Some of these issues manifest in homeless conditions, and the recent point in time count revealed more chronic homelessness and more mental health issues. A recent presentation before the council was a call to action for all within the community to help work on this issue, as there are better ways to spend these resources. One way is Jacksonville's dedication to being there when our citizens need us most. Our time in response to Priority 1 911 calls helps save lives. We're proud to recognize those who respond and work together when time and training matter most. Our citizens regularly comment on our public safety services. Most recently, that came during an advisory committee summit where we asked the citizen advisors what things we should be working on in the face of changing growth patterns. The City Council has taken bold actions to work to provide infrastructure in areas where future growth could occur while protecting the infrastructure for areas where our citizens live now. A strong demonstration of that is the new connector from Northwoods to our wastewater treatment site. This provides service to new areas and improves service to existing areas in Jacksonville. The citizen advisors were very interested in new road projects, how the new transportation control center is helping to maximize capacity on existing roads, and what other options there are for travel within the city, including expansion of Jacksonville Transit. Those citizen advisors wanted actions to make this a great community for military and civilians alike, noting most of the growth has come from non-military connections. They and the military can benefit from the quality of life projects such as Lejeune Greenway, our new splash pad, and our dedication to parks. Jacksonville is considering investing in more land for future parks. Consider the effect of Riverwalk Crossing Park as a first action in downtown Jacksonville. It brought events, gave confidence to new residents, and encouraged new housing and commerce. Jacksonville has made a commitment to invest in older neighborhoods, and the new Office of Livable Neighborhoods connects citizens directly to city resources that can help keep neighborhoods viable. It's all about how we want to work collaboratively to achieve a better Jacksonville. Thank you very much. How's everybody doing? Good. Well, we're on the home stretch now. So we've got one more to go, Dr. Lingle. Again, it's an honor and a privilege to be asked to talk about our community hospital. I'd like for all of us in this moment of time to pause for a second, and for those who will be watching this on G10, to think about how grateful we are and what we're proud of. I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud of our armed forces, and I'm proud that I was able to serve for 21 years as an officer in the United States Army. Nothing bad about the Marine Corps, but Dr. Ling and I <laughs> went to a path less traveled. <laughs> 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 I 
I'm great of the old North State, North Carolina. This is now my home. Uh, like many of us in the military, we traveled throughout the world. And as we traveled, our family made the best of where we were. And I can tell you, of every place I've traveled, Jacksonville is a great place. And now let's give it our community applause for that. Uh, I'm proud of our, our county and city officials and state officials. I'm proud of the military that's here. I'm proud of our school system. And I'm proud of uh, our community college and all the great leaders and people where we are the, what I call the critical mass. You know, as Charles Dickens stated, uh, it's the best of times, the worst of times. It's the spring of hope or the winter of despair. It's all how you look at it. I think these are great times. This is our generation. A generation goeth and a generation cometh. This is our generation, and we're going to be asked and reflect on, you had the baton, you're in the race, and what did you accomplish? So let's talk about uh, what I'm very proud of as well. I'm proud to be the chief executive officer of our community hospital, Onslow Memorial Hospital, a great a dedicated team that serve every day. I'm very proud of our board members, uh, those that are here with it, like to stand and be recognized, the members of our hospital board and, and foundation board. Let's give them a Thank you. I thank the county commissioners and their leadership and their guidance, the support of our community hospital and the appointment of these great folks to serve our hospital. I'm proud of our management team, executive team. For those that are here this morning, will they stand and be recognized, our management team? Thanks, folks. I'm proud of our 1,200 employees, managers and leaders and supervisors who are all back at the hospital doing great deeds for this community. I'm proud of our 160 members of our medical staff and over 120 volunteers who serve for a calling from the heart with a passion of caring for others. I'm proud to report that the state of our hospital is the best that it has ever been. Here, here. Uh, we had unphenomenal uh, performance this past year in finances, quality, services, and, and safety within our hospital. Historical benchmarks that we accomplished this past year. You know, uh, I don't know about you folks, but sometimes I hear rumors. People come to talk to me about rumors and things that they've been told. And I say, well, where did you hear this? I don't remember. I don't know. Well, how did you, why do you believe that? Well, someone, I heard this. I don't know about you guys, but anybody that's having delusions <laughs> and hearing voices, there's a clinical name for it. Uh, so don't believe everything you hear. <laughs> what I'm here this morning is talk about some of those rumors. Some folks say, well, uh, the hospital really doesn't do that much. What, have you, what do you really do in the county? Well, let me give you a couple of numbers. This past year, 2015, we provided health care services with 62,000 in our emergency department. 55,000 in our outlining clinics that belong to the hospital. 30,000 diagnostic visits in our diagnostic center. 10,000 radiation treatments in our radiation oncology center. We admitted 9,000 folks to the hospital. We did over 8,000 surgical procedures. And we brought 1,700 people into the new world as newborn babies. That's just a couple of things that I can go on about all the other things that we do. Uh, but those are some of the basics. Then some people say, you know, I heard that the quality of care uh, is questionable. And is that place really safe? And uh, well, let me just tell you a couple things. And you can check these out. We were surveyed by the Joint Commission, our accreditation body, this past year of the thousands of standards that we have to meet, of protocols and policies. And this is the accreditation body for the highest level of standards of care and quality. We only received three recommendations and fully accredited by the Joint Commission this past year. We scored a score of A by LeapFrog the past two quarters and the two previous quarters to that, we scored a B. Not too many hospitals in this area can uh, state that they've got a LeapFrog score of an A. 
We're one of the 100 top 100 hospitals in the United States, appointed by the self-care organization for self-care delivery in hospitals. Of 4,800 hospitals in our nation, Onslow Memorial Hospital is one of 100. In the state of North Carolina, of 122 hospitals, we're the top four. Only three other hospitals received on that list of being the top 100. So those are some of the quality indicators that we have. Then I hear said folks says, well, you know, you don't have much technology. You just don't have the state-of-the-art technology. I said, well, who told you that? I don't know. Someone told me that's what I was told. <laughs> but we have PET scan, state-of-the-art PET scan, state-of-the-art MRI, state-of-the-art CT scan, and this coming spring, this coming spring, we'll be installing the latest GE MRI uh, scanner, 62-channel capacity, 1.5 Tesla magnet, short bore, wide bore that accommodate up to 500 pounds with a faster throughput without any noise. So those who have that claustrophobia effect, uh, that will go away with this MRI. Again, it's the latest, the greatest GE model MRI uh, in the country today. This coming spring, we'll be installing a 64 slice CT scan within our radiology department. We have the state-of-the-art radiation oncology services. In our Women's Imaging Center, we have state-of-the-art 3D mammography. We have state-of-the-art telemetry on of our med surge floors for inpatient care. You have to admit, if you've been to our hospital, you may not like the service that much, but you have to admit that our ED and surgical pavilion is world class. Uh, we're very proud of our emergency department and surgical pavilion that has state-of-the-art equipment to include robotic surgery. We have state-of-the-art dialysis services. We have also state-of-the-art wound care with two hyperbaric chambers. And again, I can go on and on about things that we have that are called state-of-the-art. I can assure you we are up tight and got the best technology there is to be purchased at this moment in time. We also continue to install uh, IT structure. I don't know if you folks are dealing with IT in your own organization, but IT is very expensive. We spend about $2 million a year in feeding this bear known as IT. Uh, so again, we'll be doing another uh, upgrade next year. There will be state-of-the-art Meditech uh, uh, latest platform. And again, within the year, we will have a full integrated uh, medical record for the citizens of our, uh, of our community also installing uh, portals so that you can inter interface with your physician practices and get uh, prescriptions and find and get an appointment and those things will be coming down the track. We do have some challenges. Mental health folks, mental health is a major challenge for our nation and for our state. I don't know what happened but prior to 2008, mental health was okay. Something happened in 2008. My heart goes out to these poor souls and their families have the plight of mental disease, substance abuse, that they fight 24 seven. They have no voice. Most of them aren't able to vote, not able to articulate their plight. We must become their voice. It's our generation, it's our moment in time. We were here when we knew about it, and what do we do about it? These four souls live on an island of irrelevance surrounded by an ocean of indifference. Today, we'll have seven mental health patients in our emergency department. Throughout North Carolina, the local hospital ED has become the modern day dungeon to house mental health patients. We've had patients wait up to 65 days in a 10 by 10 room waiting for a psychiatric bed. Folks, we must do better than this. And it's gonna take all of us coming to the resolve that we gotta do something about it. As I mentioned with Dr. Woodruff, we met and talked to the chief. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, mental health, met, and the sheriff knows about this. It's draining us folks, and it's not the way to take care of people and we must come to a resolution of mental health. It's something that I don't have an answer for because it's gonna take more than 
the hospital. It's going to take more than just the county. It's going to take the state at large to come to resolve that we need to do something with mental health. We also have uh, sometimes the challenge of what we call images and issues related with how people perceive our hospital. We work on every day about our culture of sensing others' needs and a patient family centered care environment. And we continue to pursue ways that we can become better in what we do. Uh, what you see on Facebook is not always right. Some folks like to put things on Facebook, and uh, there's another side of the story. Uh, we, we deal with many challenges and many issues. But our future, our future is, is brighter than it can ever be. Before in our future, Angela Moore Hospital is like a bright comet boldly going through the inchoate dark abyss of the future with courage and determination. We're going to make changes and meet the needs of the new frontier. When you look at the constellation of stars that form the galaxy of this community, Anselm Memorial Hospital is a rising star. And we're going to be there 24-7. As you've heard some of the stories mentioned by the county and the city, where do these people go? They come to our hospital. Will we either take care of them and stabilize them for their disposition for a higher level of care. I can assure you and, and tell you that our hospital, for its bed capacity, as a community hospital, we are shoulder head above any other community hospital in this state. And you can check the other ones out, and I can assure you that you will find us that we're one of the best community hospitals that you can ever come to to be served. Again, it's an honor and a privilege to serve this community, and I thank you for the privilege. Have a good day. God, I hate following him. Wow. Wow, Ed. For more than 15 years, I've stepped up to the microphone at this event with so many things that I wanted to say, and as usual, no time left to say them. <laughs> Every year, the Governmental Affairs Committee of what I believe to be the best led, best supported, and most indispensable chamber of commerce in the galaxy reminds us all of how fortunate we are to live and work in this unique community. We've been welcomed and brought up to date by Colonel Tim Salmon, commanding officer of Marine Corps Air Station New River, home of so many things, but especially the training center for the awesome NV-2 Osprey. I've said it before, and I will say it again, probably this time for the last time, in my next life, Lord, I want to look like him. <laughs> it would take a stepladder and more plastic surgery than, <laughs> than even Ed Piper could produce. This is, unfortunately, Colonel Salmon's last year. I thought it was last year. And uh, he has been a gracious host, a wonderful supporter of the community, a big supporter of the chamber and its military affairs committee, and a recruiting poster Marine. And we will truly miss him. Sir, thank you for the memories. We have also received an update from a truly unique leader of Marines. Colonel Yori Escalante was yanked out of his comfort zone in Albany, Georgia, and sent to Marine Corps installations east a couple of years ago when Brigadier General Cass Castelvi was asked on very short notice 
to pack his gear and go to Iraq. For those of you who may be new to this community, you should realize that if you are a highly regarded young one-star general who is sent to a place as dangerous as Iraq was at that moment in time, on very, very short notice, you give your wife an extra long and passionate kiss and pack lots of ammunition clips in your duffel bag. The Marine Corps is sending you there for a reason, Marine. Colonel Escalante not only filled those enormous combat boots amazingly effectively, he managed to do it while participating in virtually every important event and function of this chamber, the city of Jacksonville and Onslow County. And he was still making it look easy when Brigadier General Wheels widely relieved Brigadier General Castelvi. And you just heard, he's gone now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think you may have said that last time too, sir. <laughs> Colonel Escalante's exceptional leadership, his can-do attitude, and his ability to seemingly be in ten places at once made such a huge impact on this community that he was recently selected as the first and maybe the only colonel ever to be presented the Chamber Civic Honor Award. We have heard briefly from my friend Rick Stout. Rick has had a very steep learning curve, coming from Little Richmond County to one of the fastest growing school systems in the state and the nation but he is a quick study and a lot smarter than he looks. <laughs> Nothing personal. <laughs> I don't get any compliments on mine either. <laughs> and more importantly, he is a lot of fun to work with. He is blessed with a truly dedicated board led by Pam Thomas and a truly impressive senior staff. And he is the only, get my notes here, superintendent of Onslow County Schools ever to become an active member of the Chamber Military Affairs Committee. So it didn't take him very long to figure out where he lives, Colonel. He is engaging in some very, very interesting discussions with the leadership of the base schools that could possibly lead to some groundbreaking discussions of resource sharing in the next few years. So Rick, it's an honor to work with you. Keep going. <laughs> and we have heard from Jeff Hudson, the awesome young county manager who never ceases to astound all of the other community leaders who are fortunate enough to work with him. I've been a community college president for nearly 34 years, and I've had the privilege during all those years of working with several really good county managers. I have never w met one that I would even put in the same league with Jeff Hudson. And he, County Board Chair Barbara Eichner, Commissioner Paul Buchanan, W.C. Jarman, Jack Bright, and Millionaire Williams as a group are unquestionably the best I've ever had the privilege of working with. Thank you, folks. And while I was really sorry to hear about uh, Sammy Phillips' mom, I uh, hope she's recovering, but I will tell you that I think Sammy has finally replaced even the inimitable George Jones as the proudest mayor of Jacksonville in the last 30 years. Of course, being fortunate enough to have Mike Lazara as Mayor Pro Tem, and Bob Warden, Randy Thomas, Angela Washington, Jerome Willingham, and Jerry Bittner working as an incredible team with the most impressive city manager in the galaxy 
certainly doesn't hurt. Thank you. <laughs> Leadership, vision, and teamwork, as we saw, can win Super Bowl championships. But they can also make limited tax dollars produce a dramatically different view of downtown Jacksonville from the Highway 17 bridge over the New River, a new county government center that most county employees thought they would never live to see, and a spectacular new Al Albert El Ellis Airport that is already changing the lens through which thousands of visitors are seeing our city and county. And who among us ever thought we would see these kinds of community assets completed, as our young county manager likes to say, on time and under budget. And I've run out of words to describe what Ed Piper, his board of directors, his remarkably dedicated staff, and his tireless foundation board members do year after year to make Onslow Memorial Hospital. I, I just, I, Ed, I was one of those guys listening to those damn things. <laughs> <laughs> None of us who were here at the time Ed accepted the position of CEO of what we all thought was a rapidly sinking ship will ever forget the truly amazing transformation that he and his leadership team somehow managed to accomplish. Of course, it helps if the CEO has the courage of a Marine Explosive Ordnance Sergeant, the faith of Mother Teresa, and the can-do attitude of a SEAL team leader. Ed, my friend, I would pray for you, but you would probably get struck by lightning before you got to your car. <laughs> So what about your community college? Well, if you have not turned on to the new entrance to the campus from Country Club, that's the back part of the campus that most of you have never seen, please do so. And then thank Barbara Eichner, Paul Buchanan, W.C. Jarman, Jack Bright, Millionaire Williams, and especially Jeff Hudson for making one of my executive vice president's dreams come true. Not only can you avoid taking your life in your hands by turning right onto Western Boulevard, <laughs> but you can see a panoramic view of your community college that would not exist had I not been able to keep David Heatherly as my CFO and Executive Vice President. He's not here with us today, but some of my staff members are. I'd like to ask them to please stand. And if you've been driving too fast to see what's been going on feverishly for the past six months at the former Fuddruckers, you may want to take notice of what is now the spacious, perfectly located new facility for Coastal's long-awaited culinary arts program. And again, please remember to thank the county commissioners for making it possible for us to purchase, renovate, and equip a building we would never have been able to afford had we been able to, re to uh, been required to build it from scratch. The program is fully enrolled, the students are enthusiastically learning their craft, and a visiting team from the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, our accreditation, gave us a perfect score. So Ed, take that. Last but not least, Coastal was once again one of only two of the 58 North Carolina community colleges that led the state in the annual performance measures. We have now done that more times than any other community college in the nation. Uh, we're very proud of who we are, we're very proud of who we serve, uh, and we're very proud to be a part of this community. Thank you.
Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm here to wrap this up this evening, or this morning, excuse me. Um, I want to thank uh, my staff. I've seen quite a few here today coming. Um, most are here for the first time. Uh, it was very refreshing, refreshing to speak to them about coming. I told them you're going to get a whole lot of information, and this will be one day for sure that you will be extremely proud to be uh, in Onslow County and call it your home. Um, I invite all of us to do that, to reflect on what we've heard today, get, take all this uh, wealth of information that we've been given um, from all aspects. Um, one thing, Dr. Piper, when you were talking about that you assisted in helping in 1,700 uh, lives into this uh, world last year, one of them was my first grandson, and I thank you for that. And my son and his beloved sweet Melissa had such a good experience, they're going to try it again this August, so we'll see you in August. <laughs> thank you. So without uh, further ado, I want to thank all of you for coming, and we'll see you next year. Thank you.